what would define high quality healthy muscle versus unhealthy? Non-functional, as in it's not strong. It can't produce any function. Um, the classic visual image is it's going to be marbled, meaning you have fat infiltration in there, right? Um, it, you're going to have other byproducts, uh, inflammatory responses, suboptimal ones, right? Um, typically sensitivity, beta adrenergic receptors, uh, hormone, uh, every, basically every hormone receptor is either way dialed up or way dialed down, right? So insulin, mm -hmm. anabolics, estrogens, like all these things are typically off. Byproducts, like basically every marker of healthy functionality, mitochondria health, um, metabolic properties of them, damage. Like not always every case, but like you'll see. Typically, especially something. if they're at that point. Yes. Right. Um, so let's go back to say like, I don't think that's true. However, I don't think there's a strong argument that once you and men get past about 20 to 21, that getting any more will exceedingly increase your health span. I think that tapers off. I do think from 14 to 21, 22, it helps going from 22 to 25. 22, like 25 is a lot. That's really big amount of muscle. I don't think you get any healthier there. I think at that point, now we're looking at other aspects of your health, your metabolic health, your max, your lifestyles, your mental health, like your sleep. Okay, great. That's not the case though for strength. That's not the case for max either. There are multiple multiple giant data sets. You're talking about meta-analyses on top of meta-analyses. Uh, one just came out like this week. It was some insane number of papers. It was something, I don't know what it was. It was like 5,000 papers in this meta-analyses. Um, if you look at Jonathan Meyer's work, all the way back to Stephen Blair's work in the late 1980s, early 1990s, you typically will see no upper limit to benefit for leg strength, grip strength, or VO2 max. Almost never. That's a pretty big statement. It, it does not stop. So if you are, that's like we, we say in our like coaching practice all the time. I'm like, yo, if your VO to max is great, it's not good enough. <laughs> Why? Why? Because like there's no number you could put on there where be like, that's good enough. I'm, I'm being facetious. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. I understand. I understand. But that's the number, right? So what you'll see is those numbers don't tend to stop, right? And you'll actually see like in these papers, um, the the classic one that I'll that I always think of here is is, is Jonathan's paper, um, it was actually from the uh, VA. Like there's like 750,000 people in this study, 174,000 died in the course of the study, not because of intervention, but you know how these right. studies work, right? Yeah. So it's hard endpoints is the point. Like who lived, who did not die, or who did. And you see, this is when you see these like classic comorbidity stack up, right? So you see diabetes, you see smoking, you see coronary artery disease all stacked up against VO2 max, right? And you're looking at like, those things are increasing hazard ratios, uh, for all-cause mortality of like 1.2, 1.4, like that's not good, right? So uh, you can kind of, it's not how it works, friends, but like to be very quick, it's like a, a 1.4 would mean like a 40% increase in risk. It doesn't mean like 40% chance you're going to die, right. but like it's a, so don't overinterpret that. But you stack the VO2 max numbers up, and instead of being 1.4, it's like 2.6, 3.8, 5.2. Like the numbers are that's dwarfing yeah. smoking. They're dwarfing diabetes. They're dwarfing stacking those things together, right? These numbers get large. And in that, you go from the, uh, so imagine, think about it this way. This is not what they did, but I'm, I'm trying to help folks like collectively understand what generally the research will say here. So you take all 700, let's make it a million, make numbers easy. Great. Put a million people in this database. And we say, okay, we're going to break this into quartiles, which means the top 250,000 scores you're in the top group. You're group A. The next 250,000 scores group B. You're in the 50th to 75th percentile. That's what it works. Bottom three, 250,000. You're in the C group. That means you're the 25th there. And then the bottom. Not doing well, friends. Means you're the bottom 25th percentile. Bottom 25th percentile means 75% of people are better than you. That's what it means, right? All right, awesome. If you're in that bottom group, it, like you, you're, if you go from the bottom group, to the second highest group, that C group, right? You're still 30th percentile. 70% of people are still higher than you. You're talking about risk reductions of half. You're cutting your risk of dying in half by going from just the terrible group to the still terrible, but not as terrible group. Like that's what you're really talking about. You can pull different papers and you'll see different numbers there, but like you're getting the same general point. Some break it into quintiles. So, you know, 20%, 20%, 20%. Some do 25%. Some do quintile, like there's 
they do all different things, right? Different databases, different populations, the numbers differ, but it's all generally going to say the same thing. If you go to the top though, and you say, great, let's stop the group at the 90th percentile. Those that are in the 90th percentile and compare those to the 99th percentile, you still see, you still see wow. less reduced in the 99th percentile and it does not stop. And so even going from 90th to 99th percentile still confers a survival advantage for VO2 max. And the same thing has been shown in grip strength as well. So there just appears to be no upper limit to benefit at the population level, like very clearly at the population level, to continually getting stronger and then getting your VO2 max higher. And I mean, that's a really important statement, this yeah. idea that cardio respiratory fitness is extremely important for overall health longevity. Yeah. Improvement there, there, would, in all causes. I would literally say vitality. there yeah. is almost, outside of having an infection or actual acute disease, th there's just, I, I can't make an argument for anything else being more important for how long you're going to live. The, of the controllable factors, nothing is going to beat that. And VO2 max, people are probably thinking endurance, but there's multiple ways to increase your VO2 max, whether it's high intensity interval training, we know that that's effective. Now, I've read a few papers, there's not that many, and maybe there's more now, the relationship between VO2 max and skeletal muscle. Have you, yeah. I mean, so for, as a trained geriatrician, yeah. um, what we would look at is in terms of VO2 max, we looked at papers and data sets that really, it, it seemed as if that the more healthy skeletal muscle mass they had, the better their VO2 max was. Okay, so uh, it's a manipulation of math a little bit. Okay. So uh, VO2 max is measured in uh, a metric with liters per minute. So how many liters of oxygen can you bring in per minute? That's absolute VO2 max, right? Typically, we talk about VO2 max expressed in a relative term, which means milliliters now we've gone from liters to minutes, so you got to do a little bit of unit conversion, but it's milliliters per kilogram per minute. Per minute. And so by default, bigger people have a more skewed VO2 max, negatively skewed than smaller people. And this is why, like if you take an NFL player, not even that, like just a guy who's over 100 kilos, you tend to like get a falsely, a false sense of their VO2 max being lower than it actually is because their body mass is being the denominator. It, it's, it's getting them smashed. So it's actually not a linear. Th if you look at like powerlifting uh, and weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, you don't just see like who's the best lifter, take your body weight and divide it or take your however much you lifted divided by your body weight. You have to actually correct for it because it doesn't scale that way. Like uh, a, a strong lifter who's your size, you know, 70, 60 kilos, 50 kilos, something like that. You lifting double body weight's not that hard, but somebody who's 100 kilos lifting double body weight is really damn hard. Totally. It scales that way. So VO2 max plays a little bit of that same game. High, bigger people will get um, falsely represented as smaller VO2 max because everything is being divided by their body weight. So if you're looking at relative, you're going to you're gonna lose, like the math is going to get you a little bit there. In addition, when you're smaller, you're physically total body mass, you're less likely to have, um, what was it? when you're smaller, you're more likely to have a better body composition. Just because it's hard to be 120 pounds and be 50% body fat. It, but you can do that at, at 280 pounds like pretty easily. Yeah. So it's really, really hard. So most likely smaller people are generally most likely leaner in those equations. So you're, you're misrepre you get that misrepresented. I'm glad I asked. Yeah. So what you're saying is it's there's not a direct correlation between skeletal muscle mass or even healthy skeletal muscle mass and VO2 max performance. No, there is. No, oh, there is. Oh, for sure. There's a relationship. There. Okay. No question. You will not see somebody, I'll put it this way. If you go the inverse here, um, you run a counterfactual, you will not see somebody with a VO2 max of 75 with unhealthy muscle. No way, mm -hmm. right? Because VO2 max is two parts. It's central and peripheral, mm -hmm. right? It is, the equation for that is your cardiac output, which cardiac output is two components, your heart rate. So how many times you can pump multiplied by your stroke volume, how much blood comes out per pump. Okay, that is heart. That is cardiopulmonary. I have to be able to get things in. So uh, this is where back size, lung size matters. I have to bring air in. I got to get that oxygenated air, cardiopulmonary, into my heart. I got to get that thing pumped out. Okay, then the second half of the equation is AVO2 difference. So it's the difference in oxygen between the arterial and venous side, which is basically saying how much can actually extract into skeletal muscle. So if you have bad muscle, low capillary density, poor ability to use it, poor mitochondrial function, mitochondrial function, um, you have a backup, 
uh, of, of oxygenation. So we start running, have to, we have to kick over to anaerobic side. Then you're going to struggle to handle that side of the equation. So it is two components to it. And there is no um, way to say you can have dysfunction in one side and still have a high total. It's half the equation. It won't be there. So you can be okay. Just like you can have really great muscle and poor quality of pulmonary mm -hmm. side and be okay. You do the opposite, but you can't have great and be terrible in the equation. Same thing to say, if you take somebody who's got a VO2 max that's low, and if all you do is train their musculature, you can see huge improvements in VO2 max if that muscle quality is really, really, really poor for that exact reason, right? If it is an oxygenation, and think about it this way too. Imagine going upstairs. And if you're going upstairs, by the time you get to the top, you're like huffing and puffing. You're like 70, 80%. It's probably not because your cardiovascular system is unfit. It's oftentimes because your legs are weak. Why? Because every step now took 70 or 85% of your one rep max. This caused such a large amount of muscle mass to contract. It caused a large amount of energy production that you had to kick energetic demands up so high. If you got your muscles super strong and now walking up those steps represented 10%, if your cardiovascular system didn't change at all, you're now way more quote unquote fit. That makes a lot of sense. So really they're they're interrelated. 100%. Half the equation.